Homesteads and Homeschools as part of the Liberty Hippie Podcast Network. If you like what we do, be sure to check out This Week in Liberpods, Peace Freaks, Cannabis Heals Me, and Free Markets Green Earth. We're living proof that libertarian doesn't mean washed up Republican. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is that you are checking this out. Good to you. Welcome back to Homesteads and Homeschools. I am your host of the Liberty to be here with you for episode number 98, which means you can find the show notes at homesteadsandhomeschools.com slash 098. This is the second time I am recording this little intro. Uh, the first time I had a, a cat in the room and he decided to jump on the keyboard and, uh, and, and broke my mic somehow. I, I don't know. So, uh, yeah, hopefully this, this works and we're all good for the future. Anyway, guys, um, we're getting into it. Um, we're kind of, kind of touching on a topic that, um, I want to get into a bit more, uh, in, in the future. Hopefully I'll have a, a couple more episodes kind of covering some of these ideas. So we move into 2021 and you all are out there wearing your masks, socially distancing, getting your, your vaccines every three months now, I think it says so, or not at all. Anyway, guys, my guest today is Miss Sauce over there at Living Free in Tennessee. Uh, you can also check her out on Unloose the Goose, which is another wonderful little podcast she participates in. But uh, we're going to get into it. We're going to get right into it. So let's go plant those liberty seeds with my guest, Miss Sauce. My guest today is a, a fellow podcast person. She's got a, a couple shows out there, uh, Live Free in Tennessee, and she's over there on, on Unloose the Goose. Uh, my guest today is uh, Miss Nicole Saw. So, Nicole, thank you for, for coming on. I appreciate your, your time and uh, working all the time zone stuff out because I, I, I <laughs> never learned that in school, I guess. I don't, I don't know. But, um, Thanks for having me on the show. I depend on this awesome tool where somebody sends me a calendar request and it automatically happens. <sighs> so you're not the only one. That's why today I'm like, wait, what time zone are we doing this in? Because I want to make sure I because I put it in my calendar when I was on the road. And that's like an opening for all sorts of chaos for me. So you're not yeah. the only one. You're not the only one. I'm just going to put it that way. Good to know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. You you have a I don't know. Your, your setup is pretty pretty going you you got it pretty good um and we'll we'll get into that did you start out gardening homesteading was that like your your childhood or was this like a later in life adventure that you took on and became a part of i would say it was later in life but i was exposed to it as a child so my grandparents grew and ate from their garden my mom had a giant garden and did canning cuz she was part of the back to the land movement in the seventies. Okay. And then over time, I, I ended up a city gal for a long time, lived in really cool neighborhood in North Portland, Oregon. And that's where I started gardening. I, my house had like this giant pear tree. So I started making pear cider and fermenting that. And then I had a little garden. I love roses. So I was raising roses in the city of roses. And when I moved to Tennessee, I, I hadn't thought about living in the country, but I was so attracted to this one region where I am now just on the weekends for fun that we bought the Holler Homestead where I live now just as a, a fishing getaway, basically. Just come away on the weekends. Within six months, we moved here. So I just like once I had a taste of rural living, I didn't want to go back. My neighbors are awesome. I can, you know, like at nighttime, I don't hear anything. And it's dark and I see stars like just those things were enough to get me started. And so then we're like, well, heck, let's get some chickens. And that started a whole like chaotic, chaotic journey towards learning all all things homesteading and self-reliance. 
Yeah, the chickens are chickens are a doozy. They, it's tough. You get chickens and it's all over, you know, forget it. But I like to tell people I was like building the car while driving in that car. So it seemed like two weeks ago was when I got the thing done. I was getting done today, that whole first batch of chickens. And um, they taught me what they wanted, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Um, Don't do it that way, guys. Don't do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, man, like it, it, it doesn't matter. Like there are so many projects that like I want to do and I will not get them done until uh, I'm forced to. And that, that force is usually like yeah. an animal that needs it done or something like that. So I, like you're you a know? procrastinator too then. Yeah. Yeah. It, it yeah. just, you know, happens that way. Um, and it gets done, you know, it gets done. Uh, it's Could, done. You're just cursing yourself out in the ice storm when you're building fencing or something. Like, I could yeah. have done this two weeks ago and it was nice. Yeah. Well, that, that, and that's what happened this summer down here in Georgia, you know, putting up fence and it's like 90 degrees, 100 degrees yeah. outside. It's like, man, what was I doing all spring? You know, what, what am I doing? Yeah. But yeah, firewood for us, firewood. Yeah. Like, why would you, why would you cut firewood when it's like kind of nice in the spring? Why not wait till the heat of the summer or wait till you need it and it's not cured yet? That's a great idea. That, that was and <laughs> great. Like I grew up in like upstate New York and it was, you know, you always cut firewood in the wintertime. You know, the, the leaves are off the tree. It's, it's easy. You skid it out on the snow, whatever. I don't have that luxury now. And it's like, even, even in the winter here, I'm outside cutting wood, sweating, trying to split it. And it's, it's really <laughs> nice to split frozen wood. And I never realized like, how nice that was until, until a few years ago. But uh, I will confess, I have a log splitter here. It has revolutionized wood. <laughs> I I uh, I don't know. I I maybe eventually when I get a, a little bit older. But I have kids coming up, and they can do some they of that. Do it? I don't know. Yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe I don't know. But uh, so what? Um, I guess what kind of pushed you out out of the city into more of that country sort of lifestyle? Was it just like seeing? Being able to see the stars, having that little bit of freedom, what like what what convinced you to even pick up this place and and outside of the city for like a weekend getaway? What what why why did that happen? Why? Because uh, I had enough money to do it. That that's a big <laughs> one. And it was at a time where you could get financing pretty easily, so they were doing all that stuff that led to a later crash. I it's not my fault. I've been paying all my mortgages off, um, but. It was really that city living is pretty stressful and it's an ongoing constant stress. The thing I notice when I'm in the city now is there's this constant buzz of noise that when people feel the absence of that for the first time, it makes them uncomfortable. I have the opposite thing. I get into the city and I'm like, how can you guys not like want to kill somebody because of all this distraction going on they all do. the time? They do. Yeah. So that, that was part of it. I worked for a, um, a public policy organization and became the target of um, like death threats and some other stuff oh, because of research we were putting out. And that made me aware that maybe I need to take steps to protect myself. And a step I can take is take control of my environment. And in the city, you're just exposed to a lot more well, it's not as easy to say, like, it's just hard to get to my house without me knowing you're coming. In the city, there's always somebody walking by, right? You don't know who's, yes. who's a threat, who's not. So there was some amount of fear in that. And then once I got out here just living off the land and I was able to grow organically and, you know, that's a super affordable way if you want to eat, like, pesticide-free stuff. And as I got into the, the rhythm of the life, I stopped wanting to do the things that you go to the city for, like go to the movies or something and was finding myself. And it was just a personal passion thing, right? I found myself much more attracted to putting effort into creating. And that's what you're doing on a homestead. You're creating plants, you know, like they're creating themselves. You're facilitating the creation of that. You're, you're creating these animal spaces. You're creating areas of peace for yourself. And at that time I really needed peace after that because it was a pretty emotional experience yeah, um, to, be, to be targeted like that. It, 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 and it is something, right? Like you're, you're facilitating that growth. You're, you're creating in a way, but you know, not really. And it, it, watching that is, it's amazing. It's really like until you can actually do it and then you see this little seed go in the ground and then it ends up, you know, on your plate or in the freezer or whatever. It's, it's really a, I don't know, kind of 
mind blowing experience the first few times. Like, wow, I, I did that. I can do this. I, this I is made it like to cool. NATO, which is yeah. like, you know, the highest achievement any homesteader can have, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's also a sense of well being taking control of your food because, you know, we need food, we need water, we need air, we need warmth and shelter. And, and when you're able to say, okay, I'm not dependent on an external input for food, I'm, it's happening right here. And then you have all your stuff canned for the winter and you know, like, yeah, I'm going to go buy Belgian chocolate at the store. No, no question about that. But if I, if I had to, man, I could live off this, this canned food and what I've done here. That's it. That's a, it's just a feeling of well being and security. I think. It is. And, and you, when you throw like the knowledge of where that, that food came from, the knowledge of how it was raised and, and how it was grown, um, whether it's, you know, a lack of pesticides or, you know, it's, it's, uh, a chicken that you raised up and you know that it wasn't put on a boat to China and China. ship back and forth and, you know, all this stuff, you know, how that, that food is harvested. And I don't know, for, for me, there's a fair bit of, um, I don't know, just kind of ease and, and, gratification and in, in knowing that information there. Um, but so what do you, what do you got going now? Um, gardens and, and animals and all sorts of fun stuff. We have winter is coming going right now. <laughs> so, I, I became aware we weren't ready for winter. I'm in Tennessee, so it's going to get cold. It's already, it was frozen last night. It will be more frozen tonight. And I have an aquaponics system. So if you don't know what that is, I have a, a little man-made pond um, that we call a sump with goldfish in it. I chose goldfish because I kill things pretty easily aquatically, and it's really hard to kill goldfish. So I thought I'll start with something easy. And then the water pumps up from there into grow beds. So I have what's called a wicking bed, which has a layer of, on the bottom, so like just a bed, think of like a bucket that water can't get out of, except for it comes in one side and drains out the other back into the pond. So from the bottom up, I have lava rock and then a layer of weed cloth. And then there's soil for about two feet. And then there's plants. And what that means is that water is constantly flowing through that lava rock, right? And then it wicks up into the soil and the plant gets exactly as much water as it needs. So we're using the poop from the fish to fertilize the plants wh who are, you know, basically filtering the water and it sets up this perpetuating system. I do, I do foliar fertilize on those as well on the plants, but it's a great way to grow food, especially if you're in a climate that gets freakishly hot in the summer, <laughs> which you might know a thing or two about. And like, you know, as, as long as I add a little shade cloth, I had Swiss chard make it all the way through. No problem. Like it didn't even look sad. It just gotcha. kept going. And in the dirt here I have in the soil, I should say soil. I, was I got chewed out hard one time for that. Um, I do. I, my Swiss chard looks pretty sorry by about mid August usually. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All those, those brassicas down here just don't, don't do it in the summer. It's just not happening. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we put, we overwintered like our broccoli and cabbage. And um, I tried to put some in this like early spring, end of winter. And by the time it was ready, it was just like disgusting. It, 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 it was, ugh. but um, so you, we have the invasion of the uh, cabbage worms here mm -hmm. in the spring. So you do, you do brassicas, like you do the broccoli and stuff. And now it should be harvesting now. So yeah, that is uh, always fun to, to yeah. deal with them but uh so, no, was, i'm out there hand picking them off and yeah <laughs> we did, i've done i've had <laughs> fairly good success with just like uh dawn and and water yeah. like the bubble spray like that does them pretty well um and wow then, you make time to spray your plants that's awesome <laughs> we, we don't i'd rather spend hours <laughs> hand picking worms than like prevent something oh uh, no it, it uh you know but um so uh, the the aquaponics there have you thought about trying other fish are you, are you comfortable with your aquatic skills I'm, yet? Yeah, so I'm comfortable <laughs> now. I've these goldfish have made it through three years, okay, including over winter. If I do something like a warm water fish, uh, excuse my my throat's a little hazy because I was in an event last week uh, talking too much. Um, so yeah, if I was going to do another one, I would like to add koi, which is basically also goldfish. And then I have thought about something like a tilapia or something along that lines. But then you have to 
you have to bring tilapia inside for the winter in a fish tank and then and bring it back. They don't overwinter. So I'm really into making so much. One of my big goals here is, is is to make the homestead as easy to maintain as possible. And moving things in and out for the winter does not constitute easy for me. So I have to really want it to do it. Like my rosemary's inside. Maybe, maybe she will make it. I don't know. It's uh it's really it's interesting because I think that's one of the things that like I knew and I know better, um, but I, I don't do it enough. And and just that is the the thought that goes into the systems. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to move things in and out and to waste your time, you know, moving these seedlings over here to over there to over here to over there and then put them in the ground. You know, like all these different steps mm-hmm. you have to take, that that's a lot of time and your time could be much better spent, I, I think, doing other things around sometimes. Um, but yeah, our big innovation on that this year has been that the feed that you feed your animals mm-hmm. can go in waterproof containers near the pasture or wherever you feed them at. Yeah. So we have 55 gallon barrels that are around the property and you know, the, the pigs, um, have the pig feed near the pigs and I don't have to go like to the centralized food area and then move it all around. It's just, you walk down and you go scoop and dump and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Things like that. Cause we, we are not there. Um, I got to put, I'm trying to, I think I'm going to try to put water in this spring. I've been trying to do that. The, we have like one spigot and just hoses running everywhere. Cause yeah, they, that's yeah. You and me both. I don't know why. I don't know why there's one spigot outside spigot on this house. Um, I don't know why they built it like that, but they did. And, do you have super rocky ground? No, we have clay. It's like uh, six, eight inches of sand, and then oh. it's it's clay. I'm right. I'm on the the fall line. So millions of years ago, this was like right. The, this was coastal, um, mm-hmm. and it's just I, I had to dig a hole the other day, and I had to get the the pry bar out and dig it out because it's just it's, it's too much. Um, R- rent a trencher. Yeah, that's what I got to do for for running running water, and I, I may do that. Uh, at some point now it's a little bit cooler. So uh, what kind of, uh, kind of animals you got? You got pigs. I know. Um, what else you guys got going on up there? You freeze up. Damn. My <laughs> power went out. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was telling you to get a trencher. My power was like, <laughs> your We're out. Uh, that, that, that happened to me. Um, I was doing like a online training for, for work. Um, stuff and my power went out i was like guys i'm sorry i had to miss the, the mandatory training but i'm sorry all good yeah. all good okay so How do you want to pick it up i'll just uh, it's, it's all right um so what uh you got pigs what other kind of animals you guys got out there and what, what do you use them for are they just meat or what else you do so they're meat pigs uh we have not put in place the rotation Right now, what we have is a sow that we raised, and she was in a pasture that had plenty for her, so we didn't move her around. The boar has moved in, and we're going to make bacon seeds. And then um, this, probably in the early spring, we'll have electric netting rotations going to to have them just eat grass. Yeah. Uh, I have goats as well, who, who they're, they are not meat goats. They are my friends, but they are <laughs> my weed whackers. So we tether them around different problem areas that just have like, cause I have a lot of thicket gnarls here and they're really good at eating that back. Um, so we have them and then the ducks. So the ducks are for pest control. We get eggs from them and you know, they, they kind of clean things up. They do some grazing, but I don't have enough ducks for it to be worth anything. We've got the fish. I've got bees for pollination and then I do have three chickens left in my yard. Random three chickens. We do meat <laughs> birds in tractors, meat chickens. And I think they're going to do meat but, bur, uh, ducks next year. By they, I mean my neighbors. So I have three neighbors around me and we all work as a community on on homesteading, although we have our various places. So when when a plan is hatched, like let's do meat birds, we figure out how many people have time to do meat birds so that the meat mm-hmm. birds don't turn into meat pterodactyls because you never process them or that mm-hmm. you know, they're taken care of. So I think they're doing meat ducks next year. One of them has rabbits, but but the rabbits got out and the dogs took them back to us. So there's only three <laughs> rabbits left. Oh boy. Yeah. yeah I, 
It, I, I miss I miss rabbits. That's one thing I do miss about uh, up north is is meat rabbits. Um, they were they're good and like chickens, the the, the birds. You know, um, you got to find a source for them. And rabbits, you could provide your own source. Uh, was, that was always that's the the big trade off for me. You know, that's one of the reasons that I, I like to meet birds. But ah, I don't know. I don't know. I can't I can't make them on my own. No, and it's so I did a, a poultry processing workshop this year. And did a run of meat birds and more carefully than I usually do track expenses. And we, we've got about $12 into each bird by the time we process it. Okay. So, and that's just a pasture raised bird. We are augmenting it with high quality feed, but it's still 12 bucks, right? And, you know, you can get chicken cheaper at the store. It's not as good as my chicken, but, you know, it makes you understand why they're charging 20 to 25 bucks for a pasture raised bird. Yeah, it really, and that's, um, we we have a batch uh, going now. They're they're about done. Should be done. Yeah. I think think Friday. Um, but we're on uh, that same schedule with the second round. This yeah, Friday. It's, it, it's um, and it is it, it track when you really track your expenses and you really look at it. It's um, it's kind of eye opening, you know. And, and you go to the store and you look at chicken breast and you find it on sale for a dollar ninety nine a pound. It's like how do, how did that happen? How do they get that? Um, yeah. Makes you makes you wonder all those things. But I um, have a pretty good idea how, because I have a friend who worked <laughs> in a chicken factory, but yeah, yep. my chickens are not treated that way. <laughs> and that's and that's it, right? Like that's that's what it comes down to is you know doing it yourself, you know how those animals are are handled, you know what kind of life they had. And um I'd like to think that that's a better quality meat, uh, just in that that alone. But uh I don't know. Where do you where do you get your birds from? So right now I'm getting them from mail order hatcheries. Uh, McMurray okay. was what we used this year, which is yeah. the easy. It's like the path of least resistance. I had trouble finding them this year. Okay. We yeah, are yeah. looking for a local hatchery in Tennessee that I am happy with. I haven't found one yet. I've had some that I'm unhappy with that I will not mention by name here, but I just, they, they didn't treat their birds very well. I went out there and there was a lot of poop and I was like, I uh, can't do that. So I was just talking to another homesteader in the area about like, it would be nice if we didn't need to mail them around because that's a, it's a element of stress. Yes. They love being mailed in August though. Like they get here all toasty warm, but yeah, it's, that's a problem. Yeah. I, where, where I am, um, the mail is all sorts of screwed. Like it, it, I, I can't explain it. It takes an extra day to get to me when it really shouldn't like I was getting birds from, from Murray and it would take three or four days to get them. Um, yeah. and you just imagine what, what that box of chicks looks like, but, um, yeah. but so you, you do that. Um, how much, how much of your food are you able to, to generate, um, yourself there? That is a very difficult question to answer because I'm like, does it count that I get the cow from the farm down the road or not? So I'm going to pull that off. So all of our beef <laughs> comes from offsite. I have a three acre homestead, right? And right. I could put cattle here, but I like grass and it would be gone if I put cattle here the way we have things set up. I would say we're probably only at 40% right now and that's going to bump way up next year. Um, I'm a coffee roaster and I have been putting so much into the coffee roasting business that we haven't grown as much food on site. So I did like maybe a hundred pounds of tomatoes this year were put up from the property. And then all of our chicken is from the property. So that's hundred percent. All of our pork will be from here, but I bought it from a farmer friend this year. And then the cow comes from offsite. And then we have a lot of, you know, rando vegetables, like our lettuce, our salad greens, we are producing over winter here. And that's, we're doing it hydroponically inside. Nice. Very cool. That's, that's always something, you know, it's like you talk to people, you know, and I think maybe people hear other, other people talk about things and then they, they have this assumption that, that that person is, is creating all their food or they have all this stuff. And like, it's a, it's a process, it's a buildup, you know, it's not like you start out and you're making everything overnight. It, it takes a long time to build up to that. Um, you know, it's one of those things I think people kind of. My best number, I did 80% one year. Mm -hmm. That was my best number. I'm also keto, so I don't eat grains. So that takes that whole thing off the table. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that was, I would say we trade a lot for stuff in the area. That's, Good deal. we probably Good deal. still will. I yeah, would say. Why, yeah, why not? Um, so how, I guess, how was that finding 
finding people to trade with, finding people to to barter with there? My first four or five years here, I had a hard time finding anybody to trade with. And then I started selling my surplus at the farmer's market, which is not a good way to make money, but it's a good way to make relationships. (laughs) And, And then I discovered this whole regenerative agriculture network in Tennessee that I had somehow not found once I got here. And from the moment I figured out there were a whole bunch of people, homesteaders and permaculture people and just started talking to them. They're like so stoked to find somebody new that they'll talk to you. (laughs) Uh, From there, it was easy. And then of course I have a podcast. So then once I started the podcast, other people in the state started listening to it and reaching out. So now we have a pretty good network, both close by and elsewhere in the state to get things like lamb or whatever, because we're not going to, we're not going to raise sheep here either. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's because that's, that's something I think it, um, we've been here for four or five years, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and trying to find some of those relationships, trying to build those relationships, um, can be, can be tough at times. I know we've, we've tried to get into the farmer's market a few times and have not been able to do so, um, just because of all sorts of stuff going on. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it can be tricky to build those. Um, but I, I, for me, the ones, the few that we we have found have been, um, I don't know, more than helpful. Um, you know, really integral part of of, I don't know, being happy. I guess um, they've they've added a lot to to the quality of life. Um, yeah, I would say this: if you see somebody having an event that you can go to, whether it be something you already know, like poultry processing, or you know how to put mushroom plugs in a log, go to some of those. That's when people are asking me how to develop relationships, go take a class from somebody and you'll, you'll you set a foundation of, okay, I can actually trust this person. Cause the other thing is when you have a homestead, a lot of people say, Hey, I want to come do work for free on your homestead. That's not, <laughs> you know, in my experience, that means that I'm going to be giving a tour and, um, you know, not doing what I need to be doing. And that's fine. Sometimes we, we do tours here now, but, um, you know, back in the day when we were just building it, it was, it was more work than to just do the work. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can see that. And I, and you know, who knows, who knows who you're bringing, bringing on, showing, right. showing everything exactly. to, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I, kind of along those lines of, of trading and, and bartering and, and building, um, community, uh, so like on your, you know, your unloose the goose there and, um, kind of get into that idea of, of agorism, um, and, and what that is. And I, it's not something I, I've talked too much about on, on this show, but, um, it is something that, that is there. And I don't know if you could like a, a cursory glance of, of what is that? What, what, what do we mean when we're talking about agorism? So the agora is the market, right? Agorism is simply, I mean, like in the simplest terms, trading things for things or trading, free trade. And I think to participate, you already participate in it. So we have a fancy word for things we've, most of us have done from the time we were born or, you know, old enough to start trading a toy for a toy or go to school and, and, you know, you made chocolate chip cookies and trade it for a peanut butter sandwich or something at school. That action that just happens naturally in communities where, somebody is really good at fixing mechanical engine problems like gas engine problems. This is a thing I need at my homestead because I'm not, and I'm really good at canning food. You may find that they, they say, well, I'll trade you two cases of tomato sauce that you made for me repairing your lawnmower. That's to me, that's how agorism is works and it operates under outside of the monetary system, right? So then it's not tracked as something that's taxable to get into the, you know, the meat of it. <laughs> Can you really tax my tomato? I mean, you could, you could assign a value to it. I could report that, you know, right. $50 worth of, um, of things I sold, but it's, it's not really it. A, I don't think it should be taxed. That's a totally mm-hmm. different thing, yeah. but B, <laughs> Like it's silly to even go there. And so agorists are simply people who agree to um, 
it's like the power of just exchanging with their fellow fellow human, right? And saying, I'll trade this for that. I'll work with you. And this is how we can then start doing larger scale things with each other beyond just the tomato to the gas, right? The gas engine repair. I don't know if that's a good enough primer. But. Yeah, 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 I think so. I think so. I think it's, um, I know you put, put isms on things and they, they sound yeah, big they and sound confusing, like but it's like, it, it, it's at its very base. I, I don't think that it, that it is, but. Um, and if I look at the homesteader community in Tennessee, we have a really vibrant one all the time. They're like trading seeds for seeds or I'm just going to, I have more of this, so I'll give it away. Or they're saying, Hey, come, I need help with this. And people are doing all of these things. They don't even know that probably technically they're supposed to be reporting that to the government as income. <laughs> like, cause you wouldn't think like me trading my tomato seeds for your pepper seeds is a transaction, but the government might. Right. And then when you start realizing that you start thinking, well, why does that even make sense? Yeah. And I think, and that's why I think it's for our purposes. Um, you know, when you're making those little transactions, um, when you, when you kind of, people see those things and it, and it builds a community and it, it your, your relationships grow, right? The trust yeah. grows, the community grows. And I think for me, there's, there's more strength in that than, you know, somebody that I'm going to see maybe once a week at the grocery store. If I go to the same clerk, at the same time, same day, um, I don't know. Have you found it, it building the community, strengthening? Like, has it like in your your homestead like uh, group um, when you are, are trading with each other? I, I would imagine. I think the thing that builds the relationships the best, um, in addition to having something cool to trade and taking trades for something cool that somebody else made, which is honoring the coolness that they are, right? Which is that's helpful for the relationship. Um, is also being willing to help without requiring payment for everything. And and by that, I mean, somebody comes in and says, ah, I just got chickens. What do I do? Well, I know how to raise chickens. I can spend five minutes of my time saying, okay, chill out. This is how, this is how you get started with chickens. And so I also think if you're, if you're looking to build a community, which this year in particular, a lot of people have asked me about that, being willing to share your, your superpower without requiring you know, payment for every ounce of it, which is a different way to approach a market, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you a, a network or a, a community bank account with a trust balance. And that does not mean sacrifice your income to do that. It just means find out how much can I give to this community and don't worry about what it's giving back to you at first. It will. And I think a lot of times people come into those communities looking for something from it and not think asking themselves, what can I give to it? And, and when, you, when you change that perspective, you'll find you get stuff from it, right? And I think the other thing is, Building community, I don't think is a top down thing. They build themselves. Mm -hmm. And as I think about, because I have a really great community in Tennessee, and like without them, my last 12 months, which were really hard, would not have been as easy. I would have made it because I'm tenacious, but you know, some, some very close friends made it a lot easier for me. One of, one of the things they did is they made sure I had all my firewood last year. Nice. I didn't cut a stick of firewood last year. And that's a big deal. Like you like think about how much work that <laughs> yeah, is for yourself. Like two guys did that for me because they knew I was hitting the winter with no firewood because of some things that happened. So um and they didn't ask me to pay them. They just right. did it. So when I think about those connections in the community and how they came to me, I didn't go looking for them. They came to me. So the other thing is your community will come as you're giving out, eventually it just, it shows up. And if you're trying to be really met methodical about, I'm going to add 10 people this week, that's, <laughs> that becomes, um, that becomes some of those things that are like, you'll develop a community, but it won't be as tight. Right. Yeah. I, I think you hit on something there. It's, you got to look at it as, as an investment almost, you know, like you have to invest in your community. You have to be willing to put that effort in, kind of and, and not not necessarily expect anything back um and just know that 
it is what it is. And there's going to be a time when you kind of might need something and, and likely there will be someone there. Cause that's what, that's what it, it, it can develop into. Um, I don't know. We, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, about it like mutual aid. It is completely yeah. reasonable to give mutual aid in your community. And a lot of people have a hard time with that. But I can't think of a single person I've ever met who didn't have some time in their life where they just flip and needed help. Yeah. You know? no, right. and, and it's, it's really hard to accept, but you're like, okay, I actually do need help. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's, it's true. You know, and it's, I think when you can get help from your people that know you, it's, it's, um, I don't know, it's better. It's, it's more real than when you're, you know, going to wait in line for the, the box of food that, you know, yeah government's handing out for you um i don't know i think there's more responsibility in the end and it, and it helps people people just I, I don't know there's something about it um i i can't put my finger on it and sound like babbling but b- baboon but you know that's i don't know um for me it's just been one of those things i'm i'm trying to reach out and find people and do it we're, we're getting there how how did you did you um how big is like when you you talk about your community um like how big geographically um, do you guys kind of spread out? Mm, that's a hard one to answer because are you talking about my on the ground community or my digital one? Okay, so yeah, then there is a crossover there to some degree. Yeah, they're all so. I mean, I have people who are in my close inner circle in other states who come through here all the time. Um, so it's not exactly geographically bound. I would say roughly we have a 200 radius mile around radius mm-hmm. around here, I would guess is two to 300. And then there are outliers who either started here and moved or they just ended up in the, like sort of in the close circle right. and it's growing every month. So that's the other thing. Like even those trusted on the ground people are growing every month, which is great. And then digitally awesome. it's, it's all over the place. Yeah. 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 Um, the, the digital one is kind of an interesting, interesting, uh, I don't know. Can't quite wrap my head around it. <laughs> it's just, you know, the, the, we are unified by corporate principles. Right. And it's, you know, part of what has sparked it is my podcast. So they listen to my podcast and then they're in the community. And if they've really bought into what's being discussed on the podcast, they come into the community with a level of trust Mm -hmm. because they're like, okay, we understand, you know, we're all trying to make our lives the best we can. That's we're coming in here with that standpoint. Um, And then I will hear, like, I had somebody approach me today about somebody else in the community. And they said, this person has done a great job all year of changing their life. And when you, when you start in a really low point and start changing their life, it's like you build, 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 and you hit this moment where you're like, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. And they're like, this person's right there. And I don't know what the need is, but there's going to be a need. Can we like gather resources for them before the need is there? So that, you know, whether it's like they need a car, I don't know. They need a website (laughs) built. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be there. And I said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And then that person runs it. I don't run it at that point. I just, if I can participate, I participate. Um, and, and that should work, you know, that's, that's the digital world, right? Well, that works on the ground too. You work, that's why you're saying when you have the relationships and those people help you, it's because they know your situation. So they're able to give you the, the help you really need rather than, you know, yep. something that's helpful, but maybe not the thing you really need. No, I, I, uh, it's a lot to think about. So, and it's, I think, I don't know. I think everybody can try to just, whether it's your neighbors or your, you know, people you meet at the the farmer's market, there's build, build some of those. Cause it's uh, so much more value, I think in that than just moving about willy nilly and not doing anything, but where uh, you mentioned your, your podcast a few times, your, your coffee, all sorts of stuff. What do you, what do you got out there for, for people that want more of you? I have a problem which is called an <laughs> entrepreneurial mindset, which means I have a new die every idea every three seconds. And then I start too many things at once. You know what that's like? Yeah, a little, yeah. little bit. Yeah. Little bit. Okay, yeah. but I, 
I've simplified. I've got a coffee roasting business. We do mail or order coffee all over the U.S. and military addresses that can be delivered by USPS, so the APO, FPO addresses. And that's hollerroast.com, H-O-L-L-E-R-R-O-A-S-T.com. It's all roasted to order. So, you know, this time of year, it might take a couple extra days to ship out and shipping is slow. Um, And then the other thing I have is a podcast just about homesteading and about building the life you want to live. And that is living free in Tennessee, livingfreeintennessee.com. But if you search living free in Tennessee on almost any podcast catcher, it will, it'll, it's there. Like I'm on iTunes and Stitcher and all of those things. Spotify even. That's a new one. Fancy. I get at least uh, 10 downloads a day, a a week on Spotify. (laughs) Nice. I laugh because it's like all the other ones are based like 10. We're okay. (laughs) Not many people listening to that on Spotify, but that's okay. Oh man. Well, I'll throw those links in the show notes. I'm not sure if, I think I, I think I'm registered on Spotify. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Unloose the gooses and somebody gives us crap about it every year. Oh, yeah, that's the other one. I'm on that that other podcast, yeah. unloosethegoose.com, also, <laughs> also. Not on Spotify. Uh, <laughs> Everywhere else, though. Rotten, rotten. <laughs> but All right, so I'll throw those in there and uh, encourage people to go, go check those out because there is a lot of a lot of good information there, a lot of, a lot of stuff to, to think about and, and ponder. Um, so anyway, I appreciate your, your time. Yep, thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. All right, so at the the top of the show, I I mentioned that uh, this is a topic I'm I'm wanting to talk about in the future. And that, that topic is, is community. How do we build community? How do we reach out? How do we strengthen what's around us? Um, I'm not sure why it's, it's come up. It's just uh, something that uh, has been intriguing me as of late. And, uh, you know, we'll see. Anyway, guys, I, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, go check out her stuff. Uh, she's got a lot of, a lot of good content out there for you all to, to dig into. Like I said, show notes, homesteadsandhomeschools.com slash 098. I'll have all her jazz in there. You can go click on that and follow it around. I know some of you psychopaths out there actually use show notes. So uh, this is this is for you. These are for you. Like always, I will remind you to go over to homesteadsandhomeschools.com slash Amazon and uh, click through the affiliate link. Go buy all your Christmas goodies. It helps me out a little bit, you know, and you're, you're already buying something. And uh, might as well just you know tell Amazon to send me a little little crumb here and there. You can also go over to patreon.com slash the Liberty Hippie and check that out as well. I think that's that's about it for now, guys. Go leave some reviews on iTunes, spread the word. And if you have ideas for, for future shows, future guests, ways to, to build community or a topic you want to discuss, there's something that you're really good at and you want to talk about it. Let me know. Um, maybe we can work something out. Uh, anyway, guys, that's, that's all for today. Um, uh, I'm going to let you guys go. Enjoy your December. Hope you're all staying warm. Getting ready for Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever holiday you may celebrate at the end of the year. So get on out there. So those of you delivery, we can all reap sheaves of freedom together. I'm going to ride us this dream. I'm going to ride us this dream.